like who's sleeping on the floor underneath the kitchen table. Motion for closure. See what see how he handles it. They were wiped out. Seven forty-five. Good evening. Wow, everybody quieted down fast. Thank you. Um, welcome to the regular council meeting of March 4th. We have lots of, um, it looks like, brownies and daisies in the audience. Would you girls like to stand up and lead the Pledge of Allegiance for us? Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councillor Breton? Here. Councillor Forrest? Here. Councillor Hurley? Here. Councillor Latina will not be here. Councillor Lesser? Here. Councillor Rell? Here. Councillor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Lauren Bellow? Here. Thank you. So our first order of business tonight is a proclamation for our Girl Scouts. So if the Girl Scouts and their leaders, and we have Jennifer Moore, the service manager. If you'd all like to come up to the podium over here, I can read your proclamation. <clears throat> They're progressives, and I can't figure out how to read out of them yet. <laughs> come on over, girls. Okay, are you ready? It says, whereas 2019 marks the 107th anniversary of Girl Scouts of the United States of America, the largest and most successful leadership program for girls in the world, and whereas Girl Scouts unleashes the GIRL go-getter, innovator, risk-taker leader in every girl preparing her for a lifetime of leadership, and whereas Girl Scouts offers girls 21st century programming in science, technology, engineering, and math, the outdoors, entrepreneurship, and beyond that is designed to cater to the strengths of girls' leadership development and help them to develop invaluable life skills. Whereas research shows that girls learn best in an all-girl, girl-led environment in which their specific needs are addressed and met. Whereas, as the world's premier leadership development organization for girls, Girl Scouts welcomes girls of all backgrounds and interests who want to develop the courage, confidence, and character to make the world a better place. And whereas the Girl Scout Gold Award, the highest and most prestigious award in Girl Scouting, calls on Girl Scouts in grades 9 to 12 to take on projects and have a measurable and sustainable impact on a community by first assessing a need, designing a solution, completing a project, and inspiring others to sustain it. Whereas with more than 100 years of experience, Girl Scouts brings a wealth of knowledge to programs that deliver girls cornerstone experiences with benefits that last a lifetime. Today, more than 50 million women are Girl Scout alum, and 2.6 million girls and adults are current members. Now, therefore, on behalf of the town council, I, Amy Morin Bello, as mayor of the town of Wethersfield, here unto applaud the Girl Scout movement and Girl Scouts of Connecticut for providing girls with a safe, inclusive space where they can hone their skills, develop leadership abilities, and declare the 12th of March to be Girl Scout Day. And Jennifer, did you want to come up and say a few words? I'd like to thank the mayor and our wonderful community for supporting the nearly 300 Girl Scouts who live and reside in Wethersfield. I'd like to also thank those who brought cookies from the girls and who supported our, our military overseas. These girls are our future leaders, and through Girl Scouting, they're learning how to make the world a better place. Thank you again. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, girls, and thank you to the leaders.
Okay, our next uh, order of business is public comment. Any member of the public who would like to speak has five minutes. Please come up and state your name and address and speak clearly into the microphone. Is there anybody who would like to speak? Mr. Mazzarella, come on up. Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. Uh, welcome, Mr. Evans, to our first meeting here. We'll go easy on you tonight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I've been, I've been thinking about local government and how government works and how decisions get made. And, you know, I understand the concept. We have nine elected officials here. We have a town manager that helps implement the policy set by the council. And I was reading about how government decisions are made and how, how the process works. And I came across this, this comment that i just like to read. Meetings are the principal decision-making forum for local governments, and most decisions are taken in full local government and committee meetings. Such meetings are the cornerstone of local government, democracy, and key illustration of accountable and transparent decision-making by local governments. And I want to restate that, accountable and transparent decision-making. And I think Weathersfield needs to do a little work regarding the transparent government and, and accountability for the decisions that are made. And <clears throat> I'm going to go back to uh, an item that has been on my mind for 18 months, and that's the vehicle lift. And I'm just going to try to briefly go through it because the clock's running. But in July in 2017, we were told that we had a lift that was not in service. It hadn't been used in years. We then tabled that item for almost a year. We went back to it January 7th. Now we have a lift that's past its useful life. It's in that one year period we found out, yes, it, it is in service and is being used. But now it's a safety risk and it was noted in an OSHA inspection. January 22nd, we had another meeting where the lift was voted on. Again, we have a lift that's over 50 years old and it's not OSHA approved, it's not OSHA compliant, and it was noted as a violation during the recent OSHA inspection. I challenged that OSHA inspection because from what I knew about OSHA, OSHA is not going to tell you that you need to replace a lift. They're going to tell you to correct the problem. <clears throat> Councilor Latina, I believe, asked for a copy of that OSHA report and we were told that it would be made public once it was complete. Well, I went through Freedom of Information through Ms. Kathy Bagley. I put a request in on January 31st, and I got a reply three weeks later on the 25th of February, and I have the report. And the report was received January 14th at the town, January 14th. The meeting was on January 22nd. So there was no reason that Ms. Katz couldn't have brought this report to the meeting. What you'll find of interest in this report is it makes no mention whatsoever of the vehicle lift, none. The, lift, the report is broken down into two sections, serious violations, some of which had a fine applied to them, there were seven of those, and there were 14 other than serious violations where they point out what the fault was and they ask you to correct it, okay? Nothing about a vehicle lift, nothing about the controls being in the wrong place, not one word about a vehicle lift. That's not the only fact that was misstated in those three uh, council sessions. 
you got a lot of incorrect information, and I, I don't think that's right. And I think the town should work at being more open with the people, we're the taxpayers. Granted, there's not a lot of them out here sitting in this room. They may be watching on TV, I don't know. But we have a right to know how our money's being spent and why. And to make a decision, you need to have all the facts so that you can evaluate the pros and the cons and make a valid decision. I can't fault you for making what I think is the wrong decision because you based it on incorrect information. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Colantonio? Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Good evening. Welcome, Mr. Evans Wright. It's, uh, it's good. You're going to stick around for a while, right? <laughs> we hope yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you're still young, so you've got time. <laughs> uh, here I am again, like, you know, sitting up right here or coming up right here and complain. We had a pretty good s storm last night, this morning. It was good. It was light. Uh, about 8.30, I went out, and it took me about a couple hours to clean the the driveway and the, and the sidewalk. And when I was all done, basically all the sidewalks on Morrison Avenue was done except for the sidewalk across from, from Orchard. I looked down and I said, wow, that's not done. And all of a sudden, you know, on top of the sidewalk, it was not like, you know, eight to ten inches of snow. It was about three feet of snow. And, and, and I got upset. I see things that uh, they should not be done. So I walked down, and guess what? It looked like uh, the snow plows or uh, physical services, I guess, you know, that's uh, under them. They pushed with the snow plow all the way across, all the way on the sidewalk. Now, the sidewalk where what I'm talking about, right across from Orchard, is where it changes from a three foot grass strip to nothing at all. Now, you know, I guess the young guy is there. Uh, he can shovel it. But if you take an orderly person like me, three feet of, you know, snow, and, and when, when it's touched by the snow plow, it's not just uh, normal snow, it's heavy snow. What are we supposed to do with that? I mean, there is in the regulations, is we're not allowed to put the snow from one side of the road, from my driveway, all the way on the other side. What, what did the, the town do there? It went all the way from the street and it pushed it all the way on the other side. Now, I believe that my wife took a, took a picture and sent it to the town manager and also Kathy, I guess, you know, the physical service, the person in charge. Sally. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but you know, I'm sure that that it happened in my front yard or like, you know, nearby, and, and something like this happens all the time. I wish there were more accountability in town. It seems that every time we have a union and in government, there is less and less accountability. They can get anything, they can do anything they want, and nobody's gonna really, well, can do anything. I mean, you know, can you reprimand them? No. Having said that, though, you know, I have to say that basically when it snows, Morrison Avenue is a mess, especially from Orchard to Tifton, because the age of payment, it doesn't line up with anything at all. From the very beginning on, on Morrison Avenue, from Silas Dean is a 30-foot road. It goes to 24. <laughs> In some places you have like, you know, three-foot grass strip. In some other places you don't have nothing at all. What a well, what a mess the town created a few years ago there. Still have a minute and a half, so I guess, you know, the past few months I've been requesting, well, I requested more than once uh, to have a meeting with the town manager, the police department, and the town engineer. I would like to get an answer somehow, and I know it's coming, but now with the new town manager, I hope it will get here 
because I would like to see or I would like to get an answer to the question that I've been asking for probably the past 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Welcome, Mr. Evans. Um, I know you've lived in town for quite a while, and you know the mess you're getting into, right? I mean, you've got the, the smartest and brightest people in the world to work with. They've made so many mistakes. It's incredible. Um, they may change you from a good person to a, like a politician, you know? Anyway. As, as you know, Mr. S Mr. Uh, Evans, I've been coming here for a while and uh, <clears throat> talking my piece. I also have been talking to our favorite group right here regarding the Keisha Farm. And I keep insisting on transparency. I know Tom tonight brought up the word transparency. He brought up some other words as well other words that I've used in the past. And, and Town of Weathersfield is pretty short when it comes to transparency and honesty and integrity. You know, you, bought a, you, you went on contract to purchase a property here in town for, for $2.4 million, $75,000 an acre, roughly. All over the countryside in, in, in this region, there are no properties selling for that kind of price. Yet you people are going forward with it. Did you buy it yet, Mayor? Did you sign the papers yet? No, the town attorney's working on it. I would advise you to find a way to get out of that deal. $75,000 an acre is a horrendous price to pay for that piece of property when all of the properties around here are selling for so much less. Tonight, I sent you folks a couple properties, one that was recently sold. I believe it was in October 30th of 2017. 84 acres of land had showed pictures. I hope you all took a look at those pictures. Beautiful farmland. And where was it? It's in the town of Berlin, uh, right off of Country Club Road, off of Route 91, about a mile from 91. And 84 acres situated, and I forget what the, what the combination was. Uh, 35 acres were in Berlin, and uh, 40 some acre, 48 acres were in the town of Middletown. And the property came on the market several, back less than about a year ago, and it took about six or eight months for it to sell. Came on the market for $800,000 and sold for $517. I'm sorry, $517,000. That's only like 6,000 bucks an acre, folks. Yet you have gone on contract, and I don't know who your financial advisors were, who your real estate people are, that put you into this deal. You know, Tom talks about you may not be responsible for that lift because you weren't fed the right information. Maybe you weren't fed the right information either from get go and you went into this deal. Do I believe that? Nah, not at all. But it's possible. But in any way, in any fact, <clears throat> here we are, we're sitting on a, an offer that we might close on. And I, again, I urge you, to find a way out of it. Because this is property in Middletown slash Berlin that sold was a darn good comp for this one. But, you, but you, did your guy pick it up? I don't know. You haven't shared, and again, here we go to transparency. Transparency that does not exist in the town of Weathersfield unless a citizen makes an FOI request and then in this case, I got turned down. You still don't have any transparency. You haven't supported one nickel on that property up on, up on Highland Street. You haven't supported it. You never have. 
But here are, I've given you comps. I've given you comps in our region, right here, that far show you are overpaying, overpaying by a lot of money. That, that little farm up on the hill is worth less than a million bucks, and you're paying 2.4. There's another piece of property that I sent you tonight, and it's for sale. Again, 83 acres in the town of Middletown, priced at 1,250,000 dollars. Originally, wrap up, please, I'll Mr. wrap Hill. it up in a Thank second. You. Originally, that property was put on the market in 2014 for 2.4 million dollars. If you go and look at that schematic that, or that information that I sent you, you'll see it went on the market in 2014 for 2.4, and it's come all the way down to 1 million 225 thousand, and it still has not sold. So Thank you. I would really think you folks should be looking at those prices. You, you don't, you can't support it. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing none, we'll declare public uh, session closed. There are no hearings on ordinances and resolutions. <clears throat> and there's no presentation. So we'll move into reports from boards and commissions. <coughs> Are there any council members who have reports? Councilor Forrest. Thank you very much, Mayor. Just a, a quick but meaningful report from the Insurance Committee. Um, as you know, insurance makes up millions and millions of dollars of our budget. And uh, essentially, there were two uh, basic sets of uh, information I wanted to sort of pass along to the town council. The first is that the committee unanimously um, recommends, I believe is the right word, because I don't think they have the power to approve necessarily, but they recommend that we continue with um, the property casualty advisor that we currently have and then also the health advisor that we have. So that's uh, Chris Monroe is really the head of, uh, one of the heads, and there's another guy, Chris, and I forget his last name, I'm just having a mental block right now. Uh, both of them, uh, the, the committee was in a position where um, the presentation was that they would keep the rates the same over the next three years as has been the previous three years. And then, uh, and I believe, so I believe that before that, there was only about a 2% increase four years ago. So over about nine years, they're looking at the rates going up about 2%. I think that's about accurate. But all that being said, uh, the advisors, um, asked for to continue it on another three-year contract at exactly the same rate and that was approved it appears that the knowledge of the two chris's along with the insurance committee seem to be an extremely good fit and that's uh and not only that but they they really do in, in my view at least have a professionalism and a, an amount of ability there that is um at least as far as i've seen second to none but um, and on then on that note was also a very detailed review of our claim history last year in the health side it was we had some significant claims and there is going to be I guess what you might call a meld in a recommendation as for, as to our um, requirements that we will have in the upcoming budget as it relates to the previous five years before last year but there's going to be some association with the claim rates because last year was such a heavy year in the health in the health field, I believe we had 12 claims that were over $100,000 each, some getting close to $500,000 and $600,000 for a single individual. So uh, with that claims history, there is going to be an adjustment up on the uh, on our premiums and, and the amount that we have to, for the self-insured portion that we're going to have to review. Um, but uh, it will not be, uh, it will not follow the exact uh, line as the previous year. It's going to be a meld between over the last five years between the previous year's history and then the, about the four years prior to that. So that's sort of a lot of financial talk into let's be ready for a little bit of a hit in the claims area uh, in our health insurance. Thank you. Yep. Any other council members? Okay. Um, seeing none, we'll move into discussion items. Town of Wethersfield draft social media policy. Mr. Town Manager, that's you. Thank you. Uh, the town has been working diligently with multiple departments to draft a social media policy, which has been included in your packet this evening. Uh, this is a working draft that's uh, being made available for discussion purposes. And I have the former interim uh, town manager, 
who's uh, from rumor has it she's happy to get back to her normal <laughs> life as the Parks and Recreation Director. I'm not allowing her to right away, uh, but she is here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Do any council members have questions or comments on the social media policy? Councillor Breton. Thanks, Mayor. I have a question. Just was this, um, did we look at other towns that already had a social media policy? Like where, where did this, how did this get drafted? Just a little bit of history on how it came to be. Sure, we, um, we have a, a subcommittee of staff in the um, town that went out and looked at a variety of different departments, different cities, different towns to see what they had for, for policies. So we started with something that was about 35 pages long and we kind of narrowed it down and tried to pick out all the things that were important and, and look at what it is from the, employee, from the employee's point of view that we needed employees to make sure they were doing appropriately and also when people were commenting on Facebook how those comments were coming in. So it was a meld of both of those. Thank you. And Kathy, this is something that you've been working on for months. Since, oh gosh, at least uh, June, uh, July, we started where we had, and it started because there were requests from two departments, particularly planning and um, parks and recreation to potentially have their own Facebook pages. It actually came from the EDIC to, st to look at a Facebook page. So we started at that point in time to research. And do you know how many departments currently have Facebook pages? The police department, the fire department, the elections, and the town website also goes into a town Facebook page. It, what, what, whatever we put on our website goes over to the Facebook page. So three departments and the town Facebook page. Okay. Um, and I noticed when I was reading them, there, it doesn't seem that there's a mechanism in place to discuss banning someone from um, being able to comment. And I know that's something that's necessary at times, but there probably should be a policy in place so that everybody's on the same page on what would, <clears throat> what would constitute um, the need to permanently ban someone from a page. We can definitely look at that. One of the discussions we have had recently was, and who would be the person that would make that final decision? And we talked a little bit about it where um, the staff member in the department doing the, um, the posting would be reporting to the department head. So if something had come up, they'd be reporting to the department head about something they thought was inappropriate. Um, if the department head, we're, we're talking about if the department had felt it, it reached a level, then the final decision would go to the town manager in terms of who would do, who would give the the okay to do the blocking. But um, we can we can look more into what is that policy? How long should it be for if someone is blocked? How should that work? We can look into that as part of this draft. Thank you. And the other thing is, has the town attorney reviewed this? Not yet. Because we still have a working draft, we wanted to make sure we were a little closer where it was finished to have uh, him review it, but that is the next step. And has town staff reviewed it or just the committee? Just the committee right now. Okay. Are there other council questions? Councilor Rell? Oh, okay, Councilor Lesser. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, um, Kathy, thanks for this uh, draft. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the monitoring, which I read there's going to be like, or the proposal is like a committee is going to do that in terms of department heads and other folks, but how it will be monitored is the first question. And the second one, does this also pertain to employees' um, use of social media on their own, or is it just the town, like uh, the town sites, police department? I assume it's just the town, but it, so those two questions, the monitoring and then uh, employees' personal use. The monitoring would be done by, we're, we're currently looking at the two departments that have said they'd like to do something with both our planning department and parks and rec. We're right now looking at one staff person that would be doing the posting and then monitoring what was going on. So that would be how it would be done. We also have, what I didn't mention was that we also have our IT department that for the like the town website, they're all, and the Facebook page, they're always looking at that too. So we'll have certain number of eyes doing the monitoring piece. 
So that's how we're, we're looking at that happening. And the second question was... Well, the employee's kind of personal <coughs> use, because I see that in the draft here that you're looking for the employee to sign. Right. We want to make sure they're aware of what their responsibilities are as it relates to a town Facebook page. So with a town Facebook page, those are, those are our, our policies. If for their own personal Facebook pages, they are personal, but there are also town policies in place that you can do what you'd like on a personal basis, but you can't put town business on your Facebook page, your personal Facebook page. Got it. Thank you. And the, the policy is a little more robust than that, but that's kind of the gist of it. Got it. Thank you. Councilor Rell. Thank you, Kathy. You'd mentioned just in the back and forth right now, uh, one person going and being in charge of content, or uh, or is this one person in charge of looking at everything before it gets posted? I just got confused real quick on that the way we've talked about it for the two de the two departments are like our our pilot program um, where we'd have um, a person in each department doing the the posting of general Facebook kinds of items and then if comments come in they would be responding back to them in a reasonable amount of time okay. so it'd be one person per department that's what we envision. Gotcha. It's not just one person overseeing oh. fire department, police department. No, no. no. With, and fire department and police department, they have um, one or two or three individuals th that are um, authorized to do it. Okay. Uh, maybe not so much in fire department or in elections, but in the town sites and the police department sites, would these have to be, and I guess Jack Bradley would you know be the final sayer on this but would they be part of any union negotiated um contracts i mean if you, you're not an employee when you sign that contract to be a um you know somebody posting on social media i just wonder if the union would have any say in what that person's role would be um you know, I, I just foresee that there may be some conflicts going on if that person's role has been changed to be the poster of, you know, all social media um, for that department. We can ask that question. Um, the, the staff so far that are involved or, or, or have expressed it, they've actually expressed an interest in doing it. It's not that we've... They've actually come to us and said, we're, we're interested. Could we do something like this? Okay. So it hasn't been, <laughs> you have to do this. Right. And you really want the right person mm -hmm. or Now, are they people. department heads that are doing this or are they not, maybe not department heads? Are they managerial positions or are they <laughs> staff rank and file positions that tend to do these postings? I think it's a mix, a little bit. I, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. It's probably a, a supervisory position. Okay. That is is where the the staff would be coming from. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Are there any other questions, Councillor Forrest? Thanks, Mayor. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to just, as we continue down this process, think about is, does this social media policy, is it, uh, how does it relate to the Board of Education social media policy, and if there are any differences in standards and so forth that I guess have we have we looked at one against the other as we have two sort of major governmental policies. yeah we we looked at so many I couldn't even tell we it's been such a work in progress um, we we looked at we looked at local and then we went out and kind of did some surrounding towns and different departments I don't think I'm saying like did you look at them and bring them back and you know come up with some type of an amalgam that created this particular draft but Specifically, is this draft different than, our, than the Board of Ed's already adopted social media policy? If there are inconsistencies between the two, that might become very dangerous, or that might become dangerous territory where the Board of Education is setting themselves up for standards, the town is a different set of standards, and there's two different standards within the same town, really. Yeah, so no, we can, I'm sorry. I would just, I would just be, look carefully at that particular one, and if there are differences, if we could understand what those differences are and why they are, it may be very specific to education that doesn't apply to the town side, but 
that should be something that we would, I think, for consistency's sake, would be important. Oh, sure. We can definitely match it up against it. <laughs> the next thing is um, I noticed, and I got, I got a schooling on this from a niece of mine the other day, on the social media, town social media sites, it's, it's sort of governed specifically into, or, or it's directed into this sort of Facebook platform. But the Facebook platform, if you're under 30, is actually the minority platform. And some, like Instagram is actually much more popular than Facebook. And, and I'm sure that depending on maybe when you grew up and what you're comfortable with, that's going to shift over time. So, um, and although we may only have Facebook sites now, it wouldn't want to have to change the social media policy every time something new came out because the way tech's been moving now, that's going to be changing the social media policy every four months. So we may want to think about the um, flexibility, might be a good word, flexibility of what we're looking at governing and, and coordinating. So this talks about all town Facebook pages must be Facebook verified. But in 10 years or five years or shorter, our new town manager might say next week that they're going to create an Instagram page for the for something. And that may, for Park and Rex, for example, which most people under the age of 25 would use Instagram over <coughs> Facebook. Um, so I think that some flexibility within the structure and that we use broader terms in order to enable the ability would be helpful. That was our intent. We must have missed some wording, but that's why we called it the social media policy. We'll go back and double check all the wording. Okay. But no, that that's a good point and a good pickup. I mean, it just talks about, you know, all town Facebook pages must be Facebook verified. Well, does that mean that Instagram pages would not be Instagram? Because there's no, so, you know, understanding sure. no. that. The, no, that makes a lot of sense. And then the last one I was thinking about was the, the scope. And I, I think I think it was Councilor Rell sort of touched on this, but there, there certainly is in all governmental entities, you know, this sort of where you, where you come, it's very understandable to know that the Weatherfield Police Department is sort of top part of the town of Weatherfield. But there could be quasi-agencies which might have some of our members that help them out. You might think of something like maybe WEC, where there are people that actually sort of work under our umbrella, but it's a separate organization. How understanding the scope of what this policy is intended for, and maybe more specifically, understanding being specific in the policy to say we are we are specifically not governing WEC or those not WEC specifically but those types of quasi organizations maybe organizations that we fund but are not really controlled by us or maybe there are or the weather or the health organization comes to another mind where we have like board members and we are a member town but they're really a different organization and I think there's a whole bunch of gray area you can go each way of that that we should be pretty specific about how what the scope is of this and what it what it qualifies for, and then of course you know does it does this policy also pertain to people that might be town employees or representing the town but that are doing it on some type of a separate platform that may uh, may be intricate with the platform upon which we are governing. So you might have let's say the Westfield Police Department. And you have somebody that works for the town but didn't post on behalf of the town. They weren't posting on behalf of the PR director for the Wednesday Police Department, but they were posting on behalf of themselves onto that page. Does this policy cover somebody like that? So different situations we might just want to be thoughtful for. I completely understand this is a draft, food for thought, but there are an intricate amount of web. There's an intricate web here that can be weaved that if we're just thoughtful enough, we can hopefully cover those issues. So when they do come up, we're, we have clear language. Okay. Councillor Hurley, did you have something? I did not. Oh. I'm good. My apologies. Anybody else? Okay. <coughs> Thank you, I, Kathy. Oh, I just ahead. have a question. So the next steps is still in rough draft, so we're not going to act on this for a while. We're still just kind of getting our arms around it. We Do we send... act on this or is this just an internal policy that you're letting us review for feedback's sake? This is a. This would be an internal policy that eventually would be signed off on by the town manager, but we're looking to get all this input from a variety of different uh, sources. Okay, thank you. Um, our next item is council action uh, workshop items for referral. We do not have this evening. The next is the distracted driving enforcement grant. Town manager? Yes. Uh, this is an annual grant provided uh, to the police department. What's that? Deputy Mayor is reminding me we should have a motion first. 
you. Thank you, Tony. Is there a motion? Go ahead. Mayor? Go ahead. Uh, I move to accept the distracted driving okay. enforcement grant for the Weathersfield Police Department for up to $20,000 for selective enforcement activities. And do we have a second? Is that a tough one, guys? Do we have a second? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Oh, I'm afraid to talk now. Go right ahead now. <laughs> this is an annual grant provided to the police department for distracted driving enforcement. It is a 100% reimbursable grant, which also includes the fringe benefits. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have the Cove Boat Launch Ramp Construction Bid. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to award the bid for the construction of the Weathersfield Cove Boat Launch Ramp to Holzer Construction out of Bridgeport, Connecticut at a cost of $692,000. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Now, manager? Sure. Uh, the town has been working with the state and the Army Corps of Engineers for some time now to address improvements um, at the Cove Park. This is a grant that's made, been made available through the Connecticut Port Authority. Um, and at this time, the city has completed the bidding process for the installation of a boat launch uh, ramp. The town is recommending Holzner Construction as a responsible bidder. And if I might add, the distracted driving enforcement grant in this bid um, are both on this agenda because they are time sensitive so that we didn't, the, the town staff didn't feel comfortable holding them over to our action meeting in two weeks. Um, does anybody have any question on the boat launch? Council Hurley? Yeah, could you just explain, um, there's a $110,000 difference between the lowest bid and the bid we picked? Yep, uh, and I'm going to actually once again ask Kathy Bagley to step to the DS to give an explanation since she's been working very hard on this for a while. Sure, we, uh, when we received the bids, the town had gotten four bids. They were scattered from about almost a little under 600000 up to, I can't even read my, um, 800000 <laughs> and um, when we reviewed the bids and looked at the, the low bidder and the second lowest bidder, we found out that the, um, the second lowest bidder had actually worked on a boat launch ramp. So actually had construction, he had worked on a boat launch ramp similar to both the kinds of conditions you're going to have in the cove, which is both controlled by tidal and, as many of you know, the high waters that we get all the time. So this, this firm had a lot of experience dealing with that in their previous boat, lo, boat ramp construction project. So we felt they were the best um, qualified bidder to go with for this project. Okay, thank Kat, you. Kathy, did JL Construction Corp have boat ramp experience? They, they did not. They had not built a boat launch ramp or had even put that on. Part of the submittal for the bid was to identify your recent projects going back a few years, and Holzner was the company that actually showed a boat launch ramp on their recent projects. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Just a comment. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, if you look at the uh, letter from the uh, <clears throat> engineer we hired, uh, JL Construction didn't submit three plan items requested until after the uh, after the bids were received, so it would have been an afterthought. So, you know, they didn't submit a complete submission up front, which could have eliminated them versus uh, the next higher one that submitted submitted everything on time. Just a comment. Okay. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. So, Kathy, I just wanted you to clarify the finances on this. So, it was my understanding in reading this that there's $765,000 <coughs> state grant and that the total cost is 742000 so the question is, is all the money covered by the grant? Because I know we also have a fund, and we were putting, or, or said in there we may have put $100,000 in. So can you clarify what expense there is to the town, if any? Um, well, when we applied for the grant, we have the, the entire project cost was estimated at $865,000. So um, the grant, um, we, so we had to put show a match for the grant. 
So we showed a match of $100,000 that was coming out of the Cove Preservation Fund because we had been saving money through the boat fees to someday build the boat ramp, but it would have taken us a while to get there. And the $765,000 difference we asked for in the grant. Now that we've got the actual cost for the project, um, we know that the grant could possibly cover the entire amount, but we're gonna have to go back to the Connecticut Port Authority when we're done in case you don't know if there's, there's also contingency built into the project. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Once we're done, then we'll talk to the Connecticut Port Authority and say, the project only cost us 800000 Do you need a percentage of the town money as a match? And then we give back part of the grant money. Or will you let us use all the grant money and save all the town money? It's part of the conditions of the grant that we did show a match. And I don't know what that'll be till the project is completed. The neat thing is we're under budget. Got it. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, we have no ordinances or resolutions for introduction, so we are back to public comment. Members of the public may have five minutes to speak. Come on up, Mr. Mazzarella. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. <clears throat> so continuing my uh, transparency and accountability kick that I'm on tonight. Um, <clears throat> I know you're probably wondering why Mr. Young keeps coming up here week after week, uh, providing you with long lists of properties that are available or have been sold in the recent past, um, and comparing them to the Keisha Farms project. <clears throat> so for accountability, I'm not sure if everyone here has bought a house and taken out a mortgage, but if you were to go and buy a house that you thought was a nice, suitable house, and it was $250,000, and you were going to put $50,000 down and borrow $200,000, well, one of the conditions of the purchase would be that you would do an appraisal. And the bank would require that an appraisal be done by a licensed appraiser and if that appraisal came back at $175,000, less than the financed amount, you would not be buying that $250,000 house unless you came up with more money on your own. The bank's trying to protect their interest and in the case you defaulted, they don't want to be stuck with a piece of property uh, that they paid $200,000 for and is no longer worth that. I think the same should apply to the town when the town goes out and purchases a piece of property. Uh, appraisals, appraisals, plural, have been done on the Keisha Farm property. However, one of the appraisals has not been released to the public. And the town, I believe, is hiding under a technicality in the FOI rules that say you don't have to release a, an appraisal on a piece of property until that is concluded. Well, I think it's going to be very difficult for the nine people up here that voted supporting this uh, referendum when it comes out that the property is worth a million dollars less than what the town paid for it. And I believe that, well, I know for a fact, in the purchase agreement that the town signed on November 14th, they're allowed to do certain inspections, environmental, uh, title search, uh, liens, and appraisals. It's right in the contract. I've seen the contract. And if any of those conditions are not to the satisfaction of the town, the town's allowed to walk away from the deal. And I believe that second appraisal that's being withheld from the public is going to show that the property is not worth $2.4 million. It's worth substantially less. And I just don't think that's a, a, a message that you should be sending to the taxpayers. 
they're entrusting you to do the right thing. Uh, maybe you don't believe it, but your being up here as a counselor carries a lot of weight in the community. And when a newspaper article comes out that says the entire council supported a $2.4 million purchase of open space, uh, a good portion of the townspeople are going to expect that that must be a fair deal because all these people agreed to it. And that's not the case. Um, would, would the town still have wanted to purchase the property if it was $10 million? What, why did we put a price on the, on the referendum question? Why not just have a question? Does the town wish to purchase open space at whatever price? Well, no one would vote for that because they'd want to know what they're getting into. So I really think you've done a disservice to the town uh, by not releasing that uh, appraisal to the public for their inspection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masarola. <clears throat> Mr. Colantonio? Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. <laughs> Uh, on previous occasion, I asked the question, what's the policy on uh, speed limit in Wethersfield? That was a few months ago, and, and I do not really expect an answer right away, but you know, somehow, along the way, I think the people that come right here and ask questions, the very minimum, we deserve an answer, sooner or later, I guess. It hasn't happened yet. I mean, you know, 25, 30, 35 miles per hour? No. I also asked the question regarding the signage on the driveway to the high school. What a mess. What a mess. I'm getting older, and it's very hard, or a little bit harder, to drive at nighttime, especially if it rains. I almost hit a car, or probably was the same car parked right across the opposite side of the driveway, very close to the intersection. That was the first time, was about uh, last year, Christmas Eve. I went to church and on the way back, I almost hit the car. Well, last week the same thing happened. Wow. Did the car break the law? No, because one of the little signs says, no parking during school days. But yet, there are four signs, two in each direction. Now, if you can picture the intersection of Walker Hill and the driveway there, basically there's three lanes. One in the northbound and one in the southbound, and then the center lane, it's for left turn only. And there are the two signs before you get there, it says left, turn, left lane, left turn only. So what do you do? You stay on the right. And then on the right side, there is that freaking parking, that car there that should not be there, especially when it rains and you get to be my age. How long is it going to take before we really going to take a look at it? Is it going to take years, like, you know, I've been fighting for Morrison Avenue stop sign? Or is it going to take some accident that's going to happen? Can we really be a little bit more accountable for the action we take? Now, you see right here, here we are, like, you know, three people, four. Every time there is a meeting, we try to come. And every time I have a chance to ask somebody to come to the meetings, the answer is always, why? They don't listen anyway. What kind of reputation you guys have? They don't listen. They, you can say anything you want. They never listen. And my answer to that is, I, I know, but just because you're going to lose or they don't listen, that doesn't mean that you can, you know, you want to give up. You got to try. Again, the quitter will never win and the winner will never quit. But yet, there's nobody here. Uh, we went to, uh, I guess uh, there was a presentation last uh, Tuesday, you know, representatives. Ross Martin was there and a few other people were there, Fen Feira, and they talked. And there were a lot of good questions, but what a waste of time. And then I, I discussed it with this guy. He says, wow, you know, I'm glad you ask questions. And so it happened that he's a, an Italian guy, Mangiafico, Paul. 
And when I told him, he says, uh, I live on Morrison Avenue. He says, oh, yeah, Morrison Avenue, you know, you've been fighting for a stop sign. I use the streets. I says, why? Well, to connect it to Silas Dean, you know, because he lives to the west of it. I says, hey, why do you use Morrison Avenue and not Hillcrest or George? Well, there is no stop sign on the way down. Why should I use, like, you know, basically Hillcrest? Or So the reasons that I've been giving you again and again, and I have to do it because of the new manager now so he can get uh, acquainted with my, my, uh, my place. In 1955, Morrison Avenue never connected to Silas <laughs> Dean. Okay? I know. I said it again, and, you know, I said it before, I'm going to say it again, and I'm not going to go away. I've been paying taxes to this stand since 1973, even though it's one year in, in singles, but I pay taxes. <laughs> okay? And I'm not going to go away. Morrison Avenue was never meant to connect. Now it's connected to Silas Dean, and we have twice as many cars on Neil Crest Avenue. And I asked the question before, and I'm going to ask it again. Why? And why nobody's willing to do anything at all? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I'd like to continue where I was before, but I don't want to spend too much time on it because I've beaten this thing to death already. But uh, in the town of, the Tony town of Farmington, there's 34 acres of land, residential land for sale on Train Mountain Road. Its asking price is $1,750,000. That's a lot less for 34 acres in a Tony town of, of Farmington compared to your 2.4 million for 32 acres in a town right next to Harford. You're overpaying tremendously. Now, I've been seeing more properties coming on the market that I've been picking up to talk about, but a lot of them are smaller amounts of land. And you know, five acres, they can charge a lot of money for it. But when you get up in the 30 acres, 40 acres, it, the, the dollars per acre decreases. And that's what we're seeing. And not only that, we're seeing where the property that I pointed out earlier this, this in my earlier session with you and that I sent to you, where in 2014 the property, 80, 80 some acres was on the market for 2.4 million and now it's at 1,250,000. That's a drastic drop in price. Now, Tom is also right about the sales agreement that you people signed for the Keisha farm. And if you go to number seven of that sales agreement where it talks about testing contingency, and it says, at all times prior to the closing, the buyer shall have the right to conduct surveys, wetlands, planning, engineering, and environmental tests inspections, appraisals, or studies concerning the condition of the property and the seller, and it goes on about the seller and the buyer, blah, 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 blah. Then, of course, it starts off with the next sentence, and it says, if the results of any tests, inspections, surveys, appraisals, or studies concerning the conditions of the property are unsatisfactory to the buyer, it is its sole discretion, then the buyer shall have the right to terminate this agreement by written notice to the seller. You still have an opportunity to opt out of this purchase. And you know, as I'm going to remind Mr. Forrest again, on the night of the, of the public hearing, he said, and he already read, he already read the the appraisal that has not been shown to the public. So he knows what that number is. I don't. But Mr. Forrest said at that time, and it's right in the public record, the price is probably, 
I like that word probably, market price for the land is his feel of it. And while everybody likes to get a deal, this is the deal and the terms that have been agreed to by the seller and by the potential buyers, which is the town of Weathersfield. Mr. Forrest is not only a politician, he's also an attorney. And he has to live by a much higher bar than politicians. That same goes with Mr. Spinella. And I would hope that you two folks look at these words that are in here, in this agreement, and go look at those properties. And go look at your own. And in reading this sales agreement, it talks about 120 days that you could back out after the signing of the agreement. And, the, and you're right now 10 days away. Tomorrow is nine days away from when your time expires. Now, it is possible you currently have on hand an appraisal for this property at a lower price and that you could justify that. Or you could go out and have your same appraiser or I'm sure there's more than one appraisal. Any town that's going to buy a property has looked at this property over time. There's more than one other appraisal behind the, behind the wall. Okay, and finish up, please, it. Mr. But I'm, I'm just saying that the price you have on that property is nowhere near fair market value. It's extremely high. And I would urge you, I've warned you, I've told you time and again, time and again, that that property is priced way, way too high. Thank you very much, madam. Thank and you. I hope you'll consider what I'm saying. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Okay. Seeing no one, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I always get this motion. I move <laughs> we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> One of these nights you have to take that motion away from Kenny. <laughs>